important topic. Uh, she's an uh, interoperable step up authentication for OAuth 2.0. I'm here with Brian, my partner in crime, with whom we discussed uh, this thing. Uh, I wish I could say at length, but given that the topic uh, is really small, we <laughs> didn't spend uh, a whole lot because uh, hopefully it doesn't require so. Um, so here is uh, how this is going to go down. First, I'm going to give you a quick description of a problem. Let me see who's uh, in the audience, uh, uh, participants, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, no, there is no Thorsten. Never mind. Okay, so we'll start with uh, the problem, the use case that we're thinking of, which, uh, given the number of votes that uh, the session got, I trust will be familiar for most of you. Then we're going to discuss our proposal, which again is tiny because uh, uh, it's mostly a matter of uh, agreeing on what to do, but there isn't uh, a whole lot of uh, margin for maneuver. And then some considerations, like things that uh, we fought and that uh, we can preempt or we can seed for discussion and then discussion. Um, given that the, the first part is gonna be short, we're just going to broadcast it. So if you have a burning question, please write it down and be ready to pull it out during discussion. But chances are that 70% of the questions you'll have will be answered by the next slide. So let's just uh, do the first three elements without uh, um, interruption. And then uh, the discussion is just gonna be completely uh, interactive and the bulk of the time. All right, so let's talk about the problem. An API can reject uh, a, the token you send at any time. Here, I'm not talking about uh, not having uh, enough uh, um, permissions or uh, like authorization logic, uh, like all the normal things that you would expect in the context of uh, calling an API. Here, I mean a client that did absolutely everything right, which still holds an access token, which is still valid uh, for what the client is concerned, and yet, when you send it to the API, somehow, like uh, it worked until the second before, and now it no longer works. And uh, here I have a very concrete example, which just happened last week. Last week I was still in vacation, as you can see from my nice color. And in my in vacation where I was, I used my credit card uh, with abandon, no problem. Like it worked uh, all the time. And then I tried to buy the upgrade for the flight back because like. Uh, and I die, I wanted to try to sleep. And I tried to use the card and this time it didn't work. It didn't work because the amount that I wanted to pay was higher than any of the other amounts. And somehow I tripped some logic in Bank of America. And so they had to send me an uh, MMS, which of course in roaming doesn't download. So a lot of drama, but here my point is the API can decide that something that normally is perfectly valid for the circumstance of a particular call might call for higher uh, requirements. And in an extraordinarily common case, it is the authentication strength for this particular request wasn't enough. So it's not like I need to ask for a different scope or like it's literally my machinery said that you need to authenticate with something stronger. And related to this, but frequent enough that it deserves to be pulled out, there is also the case of freshness, in which the authorization server said this access token is valid for X, but the API says, you know what? I don't accept the tokens that are uh, older than X, uh, uh, older than Y, so a different value. So those are the most common reasons. And unfortunately, despite of the fact that those scenarios are so common. Like uh, I had to implement these with multiple authorization servers for the years. And there is no obvious ways of doing it. Like often you end up using some tricks as in like, oh yeah, I know that this authorization server also supports uh, max age. So let me try to send a short max age. So I will force getting a fresh token. So there is a lot of like a guesswork involved. And, it doesn't have to be that way because uh, for those particular cases, 
it's, it should be easy to agree on a way of dealing with uh, this particular case, which is a uh, step up. So let's see a, an obvious way in which we could handle this. We could simply add a new error code to 6750, which says, well, insufficient authentication level. Now, don't get stuck on the words. I know that level is uh, somewhat uh, controversial because uh, it suggests an absolute ordering, which we know does not exist. But we can, the main point here is new error code, which indicates token has, you need to do something for a wave authentication with a token. And then we can just augment the authenticate header in which we can express what is the accurate values that you want and what is the max age that you expect. So those are very well-known uh, attributes. And so we could simply reuse them in this particular context. And then- I'm sorry, Victoria, I, you want to ask I, I wanted to just tie max age back to your previous slide where you, where you mentioned the freshness of the token and maybe it wasn't clear that it's really the freshness of the interactive user authentication that was used to issue the token. And then so max age here is tying back to asking for a fresher authentication, not a fresher token per se, but a, a fresher authentication associated with issuing the token. Thanks, Brian. May That's not actually excellent. clarify. Thank you. No, no, it, it's an excellent point. And uh, um, which uh, I overlooked because uh, we bet this particular topic to death for the um, uh, access token uh, when we decided to add um, Acre, AMRA, and uh, um, authentication time in uh, the JWT access token profile. But you are absolutely right, not everyone participated in that, uh, um, in that uh, party. So yes, this is uh, not the token, it's the moment in which a user performed authentication. So yes, good clarification. So the other thing that uh, we'd like to do is uh, to make it official for the authorization server to support uh, the parameters, accurate values, and max age, which OpenID Connect already introduced, but we don't have on the off side. And so here the idea is if you want to support this scenario, you sh you don't necessarily need to bring the entire uh, caravan of uh, OpenID Connect uh, implementation. If you do, you'll have also support for those two. But the point is, if you are an authorization server that does off and you want to do step up, all you need for handling this particular scenario is supporting those two particular parameters, which are not new per se, but they are new in the context of uh, off. And then finally, um, in the case in which you are using a JWT access token, then we already have claims that they are optional, but that we can, in the particular case in which the authorization server received an accurate values in the request, make mandatory. As in, if the client asks for a particular accurate value and you use it, then you should put it as a claim. And instead, if you are using introspection, uh, we are thinking that we can add to the YANA registry of the attributes that you can get back from introspection, also Acker, Max H, uh, and similar. And these uh, basically would, uh, uh, would cover it. And that's really not good at all. The, here there is uh, a super quick example. Say that uh, I try to uh, make my call uh, and uh, I attach my access token. And my token here is just like a super plain um, access token. Here, I don't have Acker. Because it's optional, I could have Acker, but imagine that I have an Acker with a value that the resource server deems insufficient for this particular request. And then all I do is send back an error. And then in the challenge, just say I have uh, the Acker value that I want. In this case, uh, I could have in a different case, uh, actually, including um, the max age, for example like whatever is the circumstance that I want. This is just an example. At this point, I just do my usual authorization code flow and I make sure that I include the accurate value that was in here 
if it was max age or some max age. Then here we do the usual dance. We get back the code, we hit the token end, front and similar, and get back a new access token, which this time includes the Acker plane. And then at that point, we just repeat our call with a new token and success, Hope, hopefully. So again, not rocket science by any uh, stretch of imagination. It's super simple. The advantages are fairly self-explanatory. If we agree on a simple mechanism for doing this, now we can incorporate that mechanism across the board. We can have uh, API gateways that uh, emit that particular error when uh, you get the circumstances that call for a different level. We can have client SDKs that automatically ingest the challenge and include those parameters in the next request to the authorization server. And we, of course, authorization servers, if they are already supporting OpenID Connect, then there is nothing for them to do. They just keep doing what they were doing. If they are, um, if they don't, it's a small incremental step. And I think that's the big value of these. Let's say that uh, you can achieve a lot of these uh, by also using, uh, I have to say, events, event syncs, communication between the various parties using uh, event-based mechanisms. But those are pretty expensive. Like they are very powerful and they can do more than this particular scenario. But in this particular case, we don't necessarily need events. This is all synchronous. I have my client, which is making a request and is waiting for a response. So I already have a channel for including this information. And no matter how I receive the uh, signal that I do need to repeat interactive authentication, I still need to hit the authorization server. So in other words, all the various legs that I have shown in the diagram are all there. And all the actions that need to occur all can occur along those pa that path. So I don't need to ask any of the parties here involved to start supporting uh, eventing, which by the way is useful in itself, but it might be overkill for this particular case. Last slide, and then we can open to discussion. First, we are aware that we are talking about authentication in the co context of OAuth. And we know that OAuth purposefully stays out of the way for authentication. So none of these suggests that it's sanctioned now to use OAuth for authentication. No, we are still relying on the authentication server to do authentication in whatever way they want. They want to do OpenID Connect. Whatever we want to do, they should do. This is more about taking into account some of the outcomes of that authentication in a way that the various uh, parties can uh, uh, use it in their policies, uh, in uh, whatever they need to do, as we are already doing, for example, for the JWT access token. The other point is uh, authentication levels are one particular case, um, but there are many other reasons for which there are many other things that the API might want to communicate back to the client which might require repeating the authentication and similar. It's true, but given the cost of consensus and given how in the past uh, other uh, um, initiatives about this, like authorization and similar, solved, they either died on the vine and creating standards which are not very and stuff like that, we thought that uh, scoping this down to a um, small and known to be useful scenario would be more conducive to progress and to actually put these in the hands of uh, developers and designers uh, as fast as possible. And for the third one, I'll let uh, Brian um, cover it. Thanks. The claims parameter um, is sort of following in the, the idea of trying to keep it simple and build on a small incremental use of feature sets. The claims parameter, I think, unfortunately, is somewhat problematic in that it tries to be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and even from the beginning, there was some pushback on its general support. Uh, some large providers 
didn't want to do it. And that's why it's actually been made optional in, um, in Connect. And there's a metadata parameter indicating it. Uh, I can't speak for everyone, but I certainly know of some vendors that don't support it due to the sort of general complexity versus general value there. Um, as you'll note, there's actually some uh, sessions here that uh, talk about doing different things, extending the claims parameter there, because despite how flexible it is, it doesn't accommodate the use cases that some need. So it, it's both sort of over fle overly flexible, not well, but but doesn't address the needs at the same time. Um, anyway, and uh, sorry, lots here. There's also not a way to use the claims parameter currently to request content in the access token, which was very specific uh, and very intentional on the part of Connect. So that would be a departure too from, from what's currently defined there. Um, it could be done, but it, it doesn't currently exist. So the, the hope here was really to go with um, simplicity, incremental um, functionality that can be widely relied upon and easily implemented in the wild. Wonderful. Fantastic. So the um, AMR versus no AMR, this is a one uh, point of contention between me and Brian, and uh, uh, also between me and everyone else, apparently. I uh, pre-discussed pre, um, these uh, with uh, Mike, uh, with John uh, during the Authenticate and uh, the FIDO plenary. And I am convinced that uh, it would be useful to include in all of these uh, also AMR values, as in actually allow the API to include in the challenge specific IMR values, uh, mostly because uh, those values already exist. And so, um, whereas uh, ACR is something which is like uh, more or less private to the authorization server, like what it means needs to be rediscovered every time, the AMR methods are not great, but they are uh, there and well known. And I, I know from practice that uh, people have been using them for from the client to try to drive the behavior that they wanted to the authorization server. And if you are thinking of building a generic piece of software, those are values that you can place in an enum and that you can use directly. Of course, uh, there are lots of problems with uh, AMR values because uh, these machine, like the granularity is just challenging. But to me, as long as we place the right warnings in, on the label, then uh, I think that it might be useful to add it. But uh, instead others, including Brian, uh, disagree thinking that uh, AMR, uh, including AMR would be uh, too error inducing. Although I don't want to talk on his behalf because he's here. So he can uh, express why he doesn't like uh, AMR here. The same sort of things you already sort of alluded to the, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, the fragility of them being the main one. They are, they are defined and they're in a registry, but that doesn't mean that everyone supports them. So to use them effectively, you'd still need to have some kind of negotiation and discovery with the AS that you're working with. So I don't know that that really buys you the sort of out of the box up and running that, that maybe it at first sounds like. There's also not a way currently defined to request specific AMR values or what it would mean to request more than one value. And if you have to uh, you know, accommodate all of those or just one of those, what kind of preference it is. And um, that's partly because when the AMR uh, registry spec was created, there was an attempt to include that functionality and it got pushed back and was removed for a lot of the same reasons, and largely around the fragility and difficulty in actually using AMR in practice. So um, both for those considerations, as well as the, the fact that it's it would require more definition and more incremental feature work to, to even have it be something that can be passed through. Um, I, I prefer to omit it from the potential of this work to, to keep things simple and hopefully uh, aid in, in adoption. Great, fantastic. And so very last point, um, we built all these on uh, 6750, which is, as we know is better. We know that uh, other uh, skins are upcoming. Um, 
we don't believe it will be particularly hard to apply these also to non-bearer schemes, but for Occam Razor and for um, progress, we base everything on 6750. And we think that we can just keep on the back of our mind the, ex the existence of other potential schemes uh, present so that uh, when we make design decisions, we don't uh, paint ourselves in a corner. But for the time being, we think that uh, we can uh, work with a better scheme without loss of generality. And as I promised, that's it. So now we can uh, open to discussion. So let me stop sharing so I can see the rest of the screen. All right. So anyone who wants to raise hands? Dimitri. Dimitri? Dimitri, you're still oh, muted. Bon, buongiorno, Vittorio. Grazie mille. Buongiorno. You're very welcome. <laughs> so, yeah, it was pretty interesting. So, could you please uh, uh, share your screen again and go back to the slide with the sequence diagram? All right. Uh, showing uh, the first and the second call to the authorization server. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with the so the, the number for the call is three. So in this case, how does the authorization server distinguish uh, the step up case from the fresh uh, authentication session? So is it assumed that the cookies be used in this case to track the single sign-on session? So, and if not, would it probably make sense to supply an existing access or refresh token as a hint? Um, I think that here, like the, the main point is uh, you're going to have a physician server with uh, an extra requirement. And uh, if a session that you have doesn't reflect that, then uh, the action will have to be that the physician server uh, reprompts the user accordingly. So uh, I don't see the a strict need for uh, including a freshness uh, um, element unless that is being asked, let's say that if a resource server uh, also says, and by the way, the oldest token I'm willing to accept is X, then at that point, I would definitely include this uh, in free because uh, uh, at that point, you'd want the freshness uh, requirement to also be applied. But here, the point is that uh, uh, all I'm asking for is accurate values equal that level. So between the moment in which I uh, obtained the token that I'm uh, trying to use in one and uh, uh, the moment that I do free, I might have done other operations with authorization server that already raised my uh, level to my acre. And then at that point, the outcome of free might simply be to get a new token which reflects the new acre without the freshness. Like the freshness is uh, possibly implied but it's not always there. Like it's up to the resource server to specify whether they want it or not. And it's not obvious that the, the, the stuff in free needs necessarily to lead to a new token. Because again, we don't know what happened between the client and the authorization server from the moment in which the client obtained the token in one. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Participants, more participants. Oh, look at all those hands. Brock Allen. Hi, hello. Uh, can you tell me what you think off time means? Off time is, as, uh, as the, like, yeah. uh, is the one that we defined in the JWT IT, which is basically the same as what you have in. Um, Open ID, and it basically is uh, the time at which the user authenticated for starting the session in the context of which the current token has been issued. But what does that mean when you have both a password and an MFA? 
especially in the right. context of persistent cookies, where I have on the login page, the checkbox that says, remember my login. And on the MFA page, you often have a checkbox that says, remember, or trust this device. So in other words, I could come in uh, into a session and have a persistent cookie for my MFA, but not my password or vice versa. And therefore to me, um, I don't know if, if the, um, like the API in this case or client at OpenID Connect, they may want to know that the auth time was for, you know, the, was within the last hour for both a credential, you know, a password and the MFA uh, second factor, for example. And so that to me is uh, ambiguous. So for me, the, uh, the off time, again, the, we should go back to the language of the JWTAT because I think that we, uh, we defined that uh, pretty clearly after a, a long back and forth. For me, the last time in which uh, the uh, user was prompted and performed a challenge from the authorization server so, uh, is uh, the last uh, off time. And uh, I see your point of like, uh, I made uh, passwords two days ago and uh, I did the MFA five minutes ago. For me, MFA, if it's MFA is the second factor, that means that, uh, yeah, that like the, um, the password was already considered done. And so the last time, uh, the last moment in which the user proved that uh, they are alive and they are capable of uh, responding successfully to a challenge, was the last MFA. And an easy way of doing this is like, if you have a my acre, uh, and that my acre as a number of requirements, the off time should be tied to that. Like if I'm giving you an access token and this access token includes um, uh, off time and uh, acre, then the two refer to the same, uh, to the same session. And I see that. Uh, um, I but go, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, again, I, I basically I've implemented this in the past a few different times, very much along the lines that you say, but I had to introduce the concept of an MFA auth time uh, into my result, into my tokens, so that the underlying API could check both because at the, you know, at the token server, when you log in, some workflows allow the, the checkbox for, you know, those two, like I described. And so, um, you know, it's never been clear to me what what that off time meant. Again, I'm thinking in the context of OpenID Connect because um, this is several years ago that I did this. So um, anyway, just a comment on my experience implementing this in the past, and uh, because of the requirement of the you know the customer I was working with. Thank you, and that, that's a very good point, and that is most definitely one of the things that they would have to be uh, echoed in uh, if we were to do a spec in here. We would definitely have in the security considerations uh, calling the reader attention to the fact that uh, there might be these kind of challenges that we might be compressing off time to the last one and if they want something different they might need to do something different and there are many other considerations like uh, very often people look at, at these uh, expecting an uh, absolute ordering of levels but that's not really the case like uh, a classic example in which I ran into in the past was uh, I'm calling a particular uh, API that has multiple methods and uh, they don't ask for different scopes, but some methods have higher level uh, requirements. And the thing is when you get the token for the higher level method, you don't necessarily want to use the same token also for the other uh, methods, mostly because uh, you might have a short max age, for example. So you might force the user to authenticate more often than they need. Uh, and so you might need to keep in your cache both the weaker token and the heightened token and use them accordingly, which of course uh, creates uh, more complexity on the client. So all these kind of considerations would have to be called out and we wouldn't necessarily provide a solution in here, more about uh, the reader. If you need to do something in that respect, those are the attention points that you, you need to take, take into account. Great. So let me see if I remember the order. I think that I've seen Jeff, um, Jeff Corrigan. And Dimitri, if you want to lower your hand, unless you want to ask another question, in which case we'll get back to you. Sorry for that, Laura. No issues. 
Hey, Vittorio, uh, question on, uh, I, I pasted part of this in the chat around 1016, but uh, as you were talking, uh, I, I was curious. So uh, once this is implemented, uh, how, how readily do you think clients are going to be to uh, parse 401 errors uh, to look for this required ACR uh, indication? And then um, the other part to that is, you know, this is pretty similar, like you mentioned earlier, to OpenID Connect. And in implementations I've seen of that, uh, there's also a prompt equals login uh, parameter that's also added to it to essentially tell the AS to force the, the new uh, authentication authorization. Wouldn't it be better to also include that on here in order to uh, basically kind of maintain consistency uh, between uh, OpenID Connect and um, OAuth? So I don't think that the uh, API has the right to tell the client uh, login uh, equal prompt, mostly because like, uh, the API has requirements on the credentials that it receives, credentials in the classic sense, not uh, in the decentralized uh, sense. And so uh, it can say something like, I need a fresher token than this. But then how that fresher token is obtained is really up to the client slash authorization server tuple. So the prompt equal login is not something that I can see an API can ask for. Like the API might not even know for technically that this thing is happening interactively. Like you might have uh, other ways of achieving that. So I wouldn't take uh, the, um, the symmetry between these and OpenID Connect too far. Uh, then if there are other things that express a characteristic of the credential, the token being sent, that uh, you think might play a role in this context and that occur as often as the ones that we identify here by all means. But I, uh, I don't know what others think, but I don't think that prompt equal login would be one of the things that you want the API to be able to ask the client. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, then Caleb. Hello, yeah, thanks for having this conversation. So we're gonna have it that? and now we're having it. <laughs> you delivered. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess first I'll start by saying like, I agree with the points that there's definitely concerns around like the, the claims parameter and reusing that from OpenID Connect, I think there's Definitely formatting and flexibility there that wouldn't be needed in this type of scenario. Um, this is based off of experience as well and implementing. But I am a little concerned in terms of having something that's just focused on a specific method, like just ACR, because then we have to go and we have to teach all the client applications and all the developers how to handle this specific header. So I'm wondering if there's some way to like make it more flexible. So it's a bit more of an envelope of maybe, you know, again, like not all of the power of the claims parameter, but that you can say, okay, here are some additional requirements required by the resource API. And then within that express the ACR requirement, or if someone you know, does wanna do AMR, here's the AMR requirement. We've also seen this type of flow and need for this type of flow around like continuous access evaluation protocols where the, the resource is coordinating with the identity provider in terms of making sure policy enforcement happens across the, you know, the chain of access. I was just kind of wondering like, if you've thought about that and just in terms of like the, the cost of going out and teaching you know, SDK yeah. developers and client apps to pick up each one of these, these values as we come up with them. Yeah, uh, this is uh, like you are hitting uh, the nail on the head. I think that that's one of the hardest parts of this because unfortunately in this space, uh, truly there is uh, the risk of boiling the ocean because uh, between what we have in here and having a full-fledged uh, uh, system that people will attempt to use for modeling their entire authorization policy is uh, like uh, I've seen it happening, like uh, people abusing the claim parameter for trying to do that. So yeah, you are right that uh, if we do this approach, then we end up having an enumeration of, uh, uh, of things. So personally, 
I'd be open to do something uh, more flexible, but I would uh, ask that when we discuss it, we bring the actual scenarios that we are thinking to do, as opposed to have uh, a place of just in case. Because like, uh, the just in case we all understand, and but unfortunately it leads to the claims parameter. So if you are thinking of uh, like, uh, imagine that we actually made this and it's now standard and we taught the developers how to do it. What is the next thing that you are thinking of with that uh, to tell the developers, sorry guys, now you've got to go back to your drawing board because here there is another parameter which expresses something different from Acre, Max Age, Amr that you need to implement. And I'm not asking you to produce it right now. I'm saying in the discussion that we are having, as we think about bringing more flexibility, I would encourage everyone to bring uh, what is that they are thinking? What is the functionality they have? For those, I am confident that they're useful and that a lot of people will use them. And so for Occam Razor, I'm thinking if we do this, I know that we'll have a return of investment. But it doesn't mean they are the only thing. So let's have a discussion about what else we think could go in there. Yeah, and I think that's fair. And I think that's a good, a good learning that we can have from the claims parameter. So to me, it kind of seems like maybe a nice way to, to take the learnings together would be having this top level parameter, which is just teach the clients, just teach the you know SDKs to do one thing, to pass some parameter through. And then instead of leaving that the body of that <laughs> to be very free form and like, yeah, just throw whatever random stuff in there, having some standardization around that as well too. And maybe the first one just is like, here's an envelope, here's how to express ACR requirements within that envelope. And as we want to do more, there's the conversations and agreement around around what goes into that. That's explicitly not just kind of like a, you know, a free form, you know, place to to funnel stuff through, which I think is what your concern is. And I think that's a very fair concern. I'm just really worried about going through this, having to do the heavy lift of teaching developers to snap to this model, and then having to do it again and keep repeating that. Like I'd rather just do that one time. Uh, it, it, it is a valid concern, but again, I'm, uh, I'm worried about like uh, having the placeholder. It's kind of like uh, if today we do a method with uh, only a JSON, then we, know, we will never have to revise our interface again. But then you are just kicking the can for complexity later. And one of the goals that uh, we have in here is to achieve uh, interop. So the tighter, the set of things that people can do, the higher the likelihood that we'll be able to do. But again, personally, I'm open to any approach as long as we have the, that backed by use cases as opposed to let's have the parameter so that uh, uh, we have something. Because in that case, we already have it. Like if people want to do something generic, they can already use the claim parameter in a lot of places. And uh, um, if they want to communicate it from uh, the uh, API, they can use it. So I think that the, the value here would be to do something a bit more interoperable. But anyway, I get your point and uh, um, I think you get mine. So we can uh, um, incorporate that in the discussion. On the, uh, I think that we'll do some proposal on the ITF working group list. So we'll, uh, we can move the discussion there. Thank you for your, uh, for your feedback. Philip Skokan. Hey, Vittorio O'Brien. Great discussion happening here. Thank you, guys. Um, I have two quick notes, um, cool, two quick questions. Um, the first one is in step three and then the following step four. If it is, if it would be expected that the authorization server has to meet the ACR values. Why I'm bringing, bringing this up is because ACR values is already an, an OpenID Connect registered parameter with a nuance where the ACR values do not need to be met. They are optional. Um, and as Caleb probably wanted to point out, the way to make them required is to use the claims parameter and make them essential. Um, so that's that's number one. I don't know what your thoughts are on this, on you know making the authorization server actually enforce the a ACR, the minimum ACR, or whether you know, yeah, it's best effort. And then if and it, if it are... and then if it if it fails to meet the ACR again, um, you know they 
uh, resource uh, resource server access is going to fail again. So before you go to the next one, let's talk about this one. Uh, personally, I'd be of the mind of uh, if you are sending these to a authorization server, uh, it should be mandatory. Let's say that uh, if you can't meet it, you should fail. Or um, we should uh, include something in the response that says, uh, I failed to do that. Um, and I see the challenge of uh, if I'm already implementing OpenID Connect, and OpenID Connect says uh, this parameter is best effort. Now you are asking me to do something different. I think we can find some little tricks, like for example, adding in the position server metadata. Hey, I support uh, um, my uh, hacker values strict or something like that. But in terms of like a developer, in this particular scenario, I think it will be neater for a developer to know that either you get the token you need or you don't. There is right. nothing, you, it's not that you, but you are absolutely right that there is ambiguity there that needs to be clarified at some level. And uh, yeah, that my stance knee jerk reaction would be, these should be mandatory. And if this creates problems, I don't know what Brian thinks about it. I'm trying to interpret his body language, but he is uh, enigmatic. I, I, I see that it's potentially a problem, at least in, in the interpretation of things, because Connect treats it that way. And I think intentionally so that, that to make sure that some authentication is returned and then letting the uh, relying party make its own decisions based on what's asserted in the token, whether or not the request was met or not. As well as the fact that the you know the request isn't uh, integrity protected anyway, so that some of the insurances around it um, enforcing a failure on it aren't as good as including the value in the resultant token and letting the downstream application make its decision off of it. At the same time, there's the potential then for like a you know an endless loop or a failed transaction. I think is the point of your concern, um, and I. I grant you that. I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, I I just shudder a little bit though when you mentioned the claims parameter and making it essential uh, because of my overall distaste for the claims parameter and the fact that essential in that particular context means something different than essential for other claims. Um, and it's Correct, just, yeah. which it is what it is. It's sort of it's it's a disaster in in my own opinion. Um, and I. At support for that, I don't know. I don't know how good it is in general. Just, just just to explain to others the difference, when ACR is essential, you're actually asking for the specific values to be met when other claims essential means that they are provided without the specific value. Um, so that's the subtle, subtle difference, right? Well, except that you can ask for specific values as well. As well. Um, and there's different rules about matching that, but essential for other claims means I'd really, really like them, but but do what you can do anyway. Um, but for ACR, it, it flips it and makes it mandatory. Um, it's all just, it's on my own distaste for the way that it's defined, it makes it very difficult to inter interoperably implement, implement in general and, and rely on the functionality. So I suppose that would be another pushback on pushing it to claims is even though it's defined that way in the spec, I don't know that you would find the actual behavior of systems purportedly implementing it to be consistent and working in any, any kind of interoperable fashion yeah. versus just hoping that that um, the ACR values would be treated uh, with some respect by the by the authorization server, which I think most would would intend to do, although I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, just just to answer Jeff in, in in chat, I'm not trying to you know force claims or anything else. I'm just trying to point out that this is how it is already defined. Um, I don't yeah. care either way, right? Um, and let me just quickly quickly do my do my other point. Um, there is a there is a piece from uh, Torsten in OpenID Connect Working Group in the core Connect Working Group uh, that defines an error code called <laughs> very similarly. It's unmet authentication requirements. Yeah. yeah. We, it, uh, it has different connotations, obviously, but um, maybe maybe it could be part of this somehow. Um, we spoke uh, with uh, Tarsen uh, before uh, putting these uh, in place. And uh, um, 
right now I have to admit that the vacation wiped a lot of my memory, but uh, I remember that we both agreed that uh, it wasn't, uh, it didn't help in this particular scenario. I think that uh, it was something to the effect of uh, the authorization saying, uh, I tried and then, sorry. Uh, so uh, it didn't really, it, it was more of like uh, one error that uh, might occur in this particular yeah. place, but yeah. not something that helps with actually performing uh, this particular scenario. It's more of like uh, expect. I'm, a, I'm, that a, I'm, a, I'm aware. It, I'm, a, I'm aware it is an error registration for f from the OP to the client and not from the RS to a client. That being said, it just uses different wording for the exact same kind of message. That's all I wanted to point out. But couldn't it also be potentially useful to to reference or refer to in in step three and four, which is covered up as an option to to remind the AS that it could use that error code in the authorization response rather rather than um, if it can't meet the ACR values, even though Connect says to make a best effort, I believe that that the stuff Torsten's working on gives an error code as an option to explicitly say that that it couldn't do that. Absolutely. So yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure that these things are on your radar, and that's it. Haven't thought you, about sir. it in that way. That's a that's a useful thought. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. And now I think Sebastian has been waiting for a long time and he has video, fantastic, finally. Uh, thank you for bringing this topic uh, up. Um, I just want to add that uh, this additional error code may be also required from the authorization server and token exchange scenarios. Or what do you think? Token exchange, 10 foot pole, me. So I think that uh, Brian uh, is going to be uh, your guy here. Uh, I think it's certainly possible, um, but would, would be really reticent to try to expand the scope of something um, that's largely about you know, interactive user login to, to generalized token exchange. Um, I think I just, Justin would, would say that uh, GNAP is better here. Um, but sure, I mean, it, maybe, if you, maybe if that's you do. the way to go. Uh, I, I think that with things like this, given the state of what's already deployed, it, it's really important to capture a narrow, meaningful scope and, and work with that and, and trying to do much more than that is where it becomes problematic in 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 getting real world deployment and value out of it. So, um, I, yeah, I I wouldn't deny the potential for the need of something like that, but I I just don't know that it, it's sufficient enough to weigh down the potential of, of trying to actually get something out there that that could be used in a near term. Sorry, I don't know how else to try to phrase that. Yeah, I, I can add that uh, I have the scenario where um, not the initial client is doing the token exchange, but uh, I have this chain scenario and uh, um, the RS2 rejects a token because uh, the uh, the ACR is, is not um, sufficient. And uh, you have the scenario if, if you have SOA architectures and, and, and bundled services. Um, and uh, depending on the use case and what uh, method you, you, you call with this access token, you may need special ACR. And, and so it's even more complicated because you have to tell the RS1 that it's not sufficient, and the RS1 then has to tell the client that it is not sufficient. So it's, it's even more complex in, in some cases. Yeah, so 
in yeah in that case uh, though wouldn't it be reasonable to think that the rs would could just relay up to the caller the, to the client the the acr requirements yes of course but then it's also chained um, but uh, it, it it would need um this at least some kind of error code indicating that uh, another acr is required um so that that was my point um to add it also to the token exchange endpoint but i i don't i'm not seeing that that part is necessary because you need to relay it up to the client because the client is the one that's going to ultimately take action with the user of course but the error happens so then exchanging uh the the access token Yeah, okay. yeah, and this is like a classic. Uh, you have a, like a middle tier that you need to yeah, go back okay. and then say, "Client, please do something else." Because, but like, uh, there's so many other things that I don't know if they are actually specified. As in, like, uh, is the token that you get in the on behalf of the flow inheriting the uh, characteristics of the front channel between? Uh, the interactive client and the middle tier or not. Now, I don't remember if in exchange they went as far as saying that that's what should happen. I doubt it because back in the day, the uh, inside of the access token, it was a, a musical mystery. So um, I think that in order for these to work, you'd need to add uh, some assumptions on how session characteristics are propagated in the token exchange case that today are not specified. Now. The assumption that uh, you make can be reasonable because uh, there are a number of implementations out there that do this. But uh, um, I think it might be a bit premature to try to, to jam um, token exchange here. But I do agree that keeping that in the back of our minds be useful because that is a problem for uh, actually transmitting stuff to the client. But uh, I wouldn't do scope creep just yet. OK, thank you. Thank you. And now finally, Hirsch. Hey, Vittorio. Hey, Brian. Thank you for this. So uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, you already called it out. Um, we do have another discussion on this in about four hours. Um, but using the claims parameter as a rough sketch, um, it was very helpful to hear Brian speaking to the concerns there. Um, and I would very strongly welcome folks uh, using that time for discussion and finding other ways to get that envelope that Caleb was speaking to. Um, so kind of to uh, add, add proof to what uh, was being theorized by Caleb, or not so much theorized, um, and Sebastian, is that uh, we do have scenarios where uh, multiple values need to be returned as part of the error. So it would be ACR values, comma some other value. Um, I don't know if that's included here. Um, so ACR values equals my ACR, comma, max age, or um, IAT equals some value. Um, does this support multiple uh, er errors being returned? It, it supports multiple requirements hmm. uh, reported as part of this error. So in this particular case, I just placed the uh, accurate values, but uh, uh, you could have accurate values and max age as it's defined in here. If you think that there are other parameters on top of accurate and uh, um, max age, then I look forward for your discussion later today in which you expand on what those parameters would be. So in other words, uh, like the extensibility is already here in the form of just like right now, we are adding accurate values equal my ACR. You might have other things that you can add later on. If there is something that, like if there is a number of parameters that are expressing different attributes or the age of a token that we already see that as soon as we ship this, we needed to start extending it then I think it would be useful to discuss what those are. But again, in my experience, in the past, I've seen those envelopes to be provided just in case. And then if they are provided just in case, that doesn't serve the um, interop 
uh, in the interop go because in terms of expressive power we already have it today although we don't like it because uh, the claims be claims parameter suck and similar. So the goal of these would be to actually have something that works out of the box, as opposed to have something that has the expressive power to work, but there is still the last mile that the developer needs to provide in order for this particular scenario to occur. So happy to uh, join your session in four hours and hoping to see those other attributes fleshed out in that context. Yeah, absolutely. I think there were a couple of those ideas already written in the chat. Uh, one was scopes. It would be nice to have a standard mechanism for saying, uh, hey, you want to call this have. API? There is one. We have it. And, yeah. and, how, and how well is it used? I'm curious. But like, uh, it's part of a standard. It's like uh, there is insufficient yep. scopes already there. Yep, yep. So uh, like, uh, the, are you thinking of a, a different, uh, like, what, what are you thinking? What, what's missing? Usage, frankly, uh, implementation. I'm curious uh, what this provides that uh, was lacking there. Uh, well, the scopes, uh, like uh, required scopes, these talks about the authentication level. Like, uh, think of a case that I, just, that I started everything with. I'm doing exactly the same call. So, in theory, the scopes that I got are already there, but the amount of money that I'm trying to sway parameter in the mm. call is determining that the logic says you need to do something different. That's not a scope. That's more about the authentication level. So they, they, you can model this stuff with scopes if you want to, no, no, but no, it's no, not no. the same. That's, you that are overriding the scopes. That is not the intent here. Um, it, it was The question here is, um, as you pointed out, this already exists, but it's uh, to my vision, not highly used. Um, so there was there was some impediment to, uh, this is purely educational for me, I'm sorry. Uh, it was, there was some impediment to implementation there. Uh, what, what existed there that you don't, why do you think that impediment won't be here? Well, yeah, first you needed to define the impediment better. Uh, uh, like uh, here, we can speculate on why people are, aren't using insufficient very often. Right. One reason, uh, one reason that I personally, but that's anecdotal, so proves uh, nothing, mm -hmm. is that uh, despite the fact that we told developers for years, uh, it's best practice, loop, progressive uh, um, uh, consent and similar, bullshit. Mostly developers say, you know what? I have one opportunity to interact with the user. I have to pray to God that they will not make any mistakes. I'm going to try to do everything in there. And so in that one thing, they ask for as many scopes as they want. They try to preempt a step up by trying to ask in advance. And then they don't need to deal with that stuff at runtime. Also because that means popping out extra uh, interaction, more opportunities for people to get it wrong. So, in my experience, this stuff is not very used just because uh, the progressive uh, uh, consent is just not very used because uh, it has a challenges in terms of uh, um, user experience. But I do know that the thing that we are describing here instead happens all the time. Like uh, I'm sure that we have these happen to us as users at least once a day. So I know that instead here, this stuff needs a solution of some kind. These might not be the right solution, but I do think that these uh, require a solution. Whereas I don't get prompted very often for extra claims, for extra scopes, actually basically never. Yep, cool, thank you. Um, yeah, looking forward to uh, talking more on this in four hours, thank you. All right, wonderful, thank you. And thanks everyone for a really interesting discussion. Um, I guess that Daniel will now kick us out and um, get to the next presentation. So yeah. the so slides are available for 50 euro. I'll give you my Vemno if you want the slides. 50 euro. No? OK. OK, thank you very much for this interesting session. And I think we are actually have a 